I think too much for everyone to you know, learn. So we will start with the new uh, next session, the first session of this day, and that is structural heart diseases. I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Mona Bhatia, ma'am, as a moderator for the session. Dr. Priya and Dr. Mohan uh, will be joining her uh, in between. You know, the early bird catches the worm. So you're the only people who are going to catch the worm. For all the others, they don't know what they're going to miss. So this is going to be the most amazing talk. And, uh, and we have the most amazing person who's going to do this. So we have Dr. Sandeep Hegde, Head Gire. How do you sp uh, pronounce your surname, though? Head Gire, yeah. So Sandeep Head Gire, who is the Chief of Cardiovascular Imaging Division in the Department of Radiology at the Mass General Hospital at Harvard. and. It's really a pleasure to have him here, and he's going to be talking about post-procedural imaging, including complications. Needless to say that structural heart disease has really got a lot of uh, traction now, and there's a lot more people and a lot more cardiologists who want to do structural rather than angioplasties. So I think this is going to be huge. So over to you, Sandeep. Thank you, Mona. Good morning, everybody. All right. So I'm going to begin by some basic introduction. And, uh, and then subsequently we have talks about uh, other structural interventions and then we'll talk about uh, the complications and stuff. Uh, so in this talk, I will be solely uh, focusing on giving you a broad overview of how CT and MR can be helpful uh, for valvular uh, heart diseases. Our objectives are pretty simple. Uh, we uh, are going to understand where can you use CT and where uh, you can use MRI? Uh, how to choose an imaging modality when you get that phone call from your clinical colleagues that I have a patient who has this valve problem, what should I do? Uh, we'll look at a spectrum of uh, valvular conditions that CT and MR can diagnose for us. We'll understand uh, what, are, what is the landscape and there are more talks coming in the line um, with what are the valve interventions that are possible with percutaneous approach uh, now in 2023. And lastly, we'll address some take home points. Echocardiography tends to be the, the first modality. So many people who come to us for CT and MR have already undergone an echo. That echo might be transthoracic or transesophageal. Please note that uh, echo is an operator dependent modality. And I always think that CT and MR is also operator dependent. If you get a bad quality MR and a bad quality CT, it's very hard to give a correct report. Uh, so it's important to get the quality right. So we will be talking about how to get the quality right. Uh, and then one thing I would like to add about echo is uh, trans thoracic echo particularly is even though it's a first modality it can never provide you the whole and sole information that you need and this uh, you will see examples of this in this talk and trans esophageal echocardiogram as you all know is an invasive procedure so patient needs to be prepped there is anesthesia involved there is a big probe that goes down the esophagus and uh, there's a lot of planning that happens uh, and again, the views that you get are somewhat limited and uh, to answer a specific question. If you are looking to answer a systemic problem, a systemic condition, it is much better uh, to have CT and MR on board. As uh, we have heard these talks uh, over um, the first day of the conference that, uh, and the second day, uh, CT and MR has advanced tremendously. Uh, the temporal resolution of the CT and the soft tissue characterization of MR has helped us to see things that we were not able to see earlier. Everybody thought that the valves move too much, so they are not the target. You can't see them, and but that's no longer the case. And you will see plenty of examples of that uh, in my talk. It has evolved from a uh, problem-solving tool 
uh, to the extent that not only it's problem solving, but it's also being used for image guided uh, procedures like percutaneous valve placements. Uh, with CT, um, it is important uh, to know that you can guide the interventional cardiologist who is going to do those procedures uh, with their approach and how they should uh, target uh, their procedure in terms of generating the fluoroscopic angles for them. And as I mentioned, MR has superior soft tissue resolution. So there are some things that MR does very well. There are some things that CT does very well. And we'll talk about uh, that in a second. In my hospital, in Mass General Hospital in Boston, the, we have a valve planning protocol. This protocol is very different than a coronary CT protocol. The valve planning protocol typically starts with acquiring two localizing images, the, the AP and the lateral. Typically decide what is the range in, the, in terms of z-axis that is required. Uh, typically that range, if you are only looking at heart, uh, starts from the level of carina and goes two centimeters below the level of the cardiac apex. We do acquire non-contrast images for our all valves. Following the non-contrast image, we do bolus tract CTA, and that bolus tracking. Uh, so we have a third generation gold source scanner. So that bolus tracking is typically placed at the level of the aorta. Please note that patients who have congenital heart disease sometimes the techs get very confused like where should I put the ROI because there is um, they can't identify the SNEOT. My advice to the tech is always that fine if you don't identify the SNEOT but please note that the DCNEOT is always going to be the DCNEOT. So the largest vessel alongside the spine is always going to be the DCNEOT. If you can't find it, uh, the SNEOT, place your ROI in the DCNEOT. That's fine. So our threshold is set at 100 Hounds fill units. After 100 Hounds fill units is reached, the, the scanner gives an instruction, which is simply taking a breath and hold it. That triggers an acquisition of the of the CT uh, CTA, uh, and I just showed you an example of a reconstructed three chamber view here. We do acquire delay images because many times you end up catching. Uh, incidental findings like thumb by in the left atrium, left atrial appendix sometimes doesn't fill, so it's important to obtain that. For injections, we follow a weight based approach. Uh, so, uh, we have a system called PPT that automatically decides what is the rate of induction for this patient's body habitus, and that's calculated based on the weight of the patient. Generally speaking, it is somewhere between 4 and 6 cc per second. Uh, we uh, we decide whether we need to opacify the right heart or the left heart. Sometimes you need to opacify both sides of the heart. And that's where you have to think about what contrast injection are you planning. If you're only planning the left side of the heart, it's fine to just stick with, say, 5 cc a second, 60 cc straight up contrast, followed by 40 cc of saline. If you are trying to opacify both right and left, or you want somewhat slightly less opacification of the right side, then you would uh, en engage in in a three uh, types of injection. Our, so our first injection is straight up contrast, followed by a contrast to saline mix, which is 40% of contrast, 60% of saline, followed by a uh, flush uh, with saline which is 40 cc's. And then delayed images are typically acquired uh, in my institution at one minute. Um, but if you are also looking for a scar, as we saw in the stock yesterday, um, then we can uh, obtain an additional delayed images. With regards to uh, the gating, it is important to choose uh, it ahead of time. So please note that uh, patients who have bradycardia uh, it's not a retrospective gating is not a good choice for them because they can, their R to R interval is very large and they, you're gonna get 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 them a lot of radiation waves. Uh, so, uh, but otherwise, uh, for valve planning uh, and evaluation of valves, our default uh, mode of gating is a retrospective. 
uh, when you are doing prospective acquisition, uh, prospective uh, works very well, uh, particularly if you have a dual source, uh, third generation CD scanners like we do. Uh, it's prospective is a great choice if there is a higher beat to beat variability of red band 20 beats, if the patient has atrial fibrillation uh, because there is an inbuilt arrhythmia rejection in there. In pediatric patient, if you are only trying to identify is there a congenital anomaly, yes or no, because echo sometimes cannot answer that question, then it's fine to use a high pitch helical mode, uh, which uh, is like a three second scan. Uh, we call it a flash mode and that can be that is able to freeze the cardiac motion. With regards to MRI, uh, I always tell my fellows do not do every sequence on every single patient. That is a waste of time. Please note what valve you are going after and tailor your protocol based on that. Now. So uh, that's why it is important. I've shown examples of a case uh, that has aortic uh, stenosis here. Uh, and in here, you can see examples of a three chamber view where you can see flow acceleration across the aortic valve. So it's important to know the valve ahead of time, uh, particularly for aortic valve, three chamber aortic valve, short axis views work very well. Uh, and then phase contrast imaging gives you uh, a good hemodynamic assessment of uh, aortic stenosis. So you can calculate the, the velocity, the gradient, uh, and then uh, if you are doing 4D flow, which is what we do uh, for most of our congenital patients, uh, please note that 4D flow works very well only if you are acquiring right after giving contrast. It's a, uh, so you are able to see those color coded images are much better if there is a lot of contrast to noise ratio is better after giving intravenous gadolinium contrast. Let's move on to how do we choose the imaging test. And a couple of things that have changed in the last couple of years is 2020, uh, the guideline for ACC and AHA came for valve diseases. It's an excellent resource to know what we should be doing in terms of imaging these patients. And second, I would say, uh, is the American College of Radiology has a great amount of resources on their website. Uh, it's, a call, it's a thing called as ACR appropriateness criteria and I've written some of them myself. Uh, so it's a great resource to see and educate your uh, referring uh, clinicians that, you know, sometimes we get these orders saying that, uh, actually last week I got an order saying that uh, my patient has aortic stenosis, please calculate aortic valve calcium score, but the order was for cardiac MRI. Uh, so what you know is not the same amount of knowledge that your clinical colleagues know. So it's important to educate them on uh, wh what is the right test. Another point that I want to address is that there has been a lot of talk about um, our understanding about renal dysfunction and iodinated contrast uh, when it comes to CG. Uh, so recently, uh, two large organizations, the American College of Radiology and National Kidney Foundation, in the United States came together and published this opinion piece saying that um, we are perhaps overestimating the risk of contrast-induced nephropathy. Uh, so in my institution, we have a policy that when in doubt, always have a risk versus benefit analysis. And if it is for life-saving condition, uh, for example, somebody has a rupture at the level of aortic root and question is aortic valve assessment in that patient, please go ahead and give the contrast. That, it, the, that much amount of contrast is not going to kill the kidney, but if you don't give the contrast, the patient will not get their test and, and the patient might die. Similarly, uh, for MRI, uh, it is important uh, to know that the risk of nephrogenic systemic fibrosis is also very low, uh, particularly if you are using uh, the, the so-called uh, the second or third uh, level uh, ACR uh, type of uh, gadolinium contrast imaging. So um, I am a big advocate of transparency. So I always tell what contrast agent we are using for our cases. And some people don't like to do that. So uh, for cardiac MRI, we uh, currently use Dutal. And for vascular MR, we currently use Dutal. Uh, both of them are very safe agents uh, for assessment of valve. All right, let's talk about choosing the right test. So if you have a patient 
who has undergone a valve intervention, as in they, there is already a device there uh, at the level of a valve, please note that CT should be your modality of choice. If you have a patient who is claustrophobic or has limited ability to lie down flat, patients come with pulmonary edema, particularly if they have a valve disease uh, or they have a lot of dyspnea, then it's not a good uh, choice to make them lie down uh, in the MRS scanner for a long amount of time. If you have poor contrast function and if, there, if you made a decision that you can't give contrast, then please note that there are a lot of things that you can do with non-contrast MR. You can acquire cine images, you can, you can acquire uh, the 2D phase contrast images to assess the hemodynamic across the valve. If there's a concern for repeated radiation, particularly in a pediatric patient or if you are imaging a pregnant patient, uh, then we tend to uh, do that with MRI. Particularly um, if uh, you are uh, entertaining a, a percutaneous valve assessment and the surgeon must need to know what is uh, the underlying uh, situation of the coronary arteries, then uh, know that CT or CTA is the right test there. For patients who have uh, undergone prior sternotomy, uh, our surgeons complain a lot that, you know, like, uh, I am assuming a lot of people here uh, speak Hindi, and we have a lot of Hindi-speaking surgeons in my hospital. So they said, yaar, mene uska sternum khola, and it was so difficult to get to the aortic valve. Uh, and there were a lot of adhesions. Uh, so know that uh, you can, with CT, you can uh, make uh, an evaluation of those adhesions. So when we do sternotomy planning CTs, we always mention what is the distance between the posterior aspect of the sternum and the ACN aorta. Is there a vascular structure immediately posterior to the sternum? And if you are using tagging, uh, that's another way to assess for adhesions, particularly if there are pericardial adhesions. Uh, as I mentioned before, flow quantification is much more superior with MR and know that CT cannot give you that. So what all can be diagnosed with CT and MR when it comes to valve diseases? We can diagnose congenital valve abnormalities. We can diagnose stenosis, regurgitation. We can diagnose infective endocarditis. Uh, CT is excellent for percutaneous valve planning procedures. Uh, and uh, Zeeshan, my friend here, is going to talk about uh, some of them uh, later during this session. Uh, you can assess masses that are pertinent to the valves. And then uh, you can also catch, uh, if the patient has a systemic disease, you can also catch valvular abnormalities. All right. So let's start by seeing some case examples. Here is a case of a congenital lesion. This patient has Epstein's anomaly. Uh, Typically, there is uh, atrial displacement of the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve and atrialization of the ventricle. Uh, what you're looking for is, uh, if, you, if this is a pediatric patient, you want to know if the mother had uh, lithium intake uh, during the pregnancy. Uh, so we, we, we provide the distance from the annulus. Uh, an example of another congenital valve lesion is quadricuspid pulmonic valve. Uh, in these, uh, these type of valves are, uh, abnormalities are rare but often common. Um, many times uh, when you acquire multi-phase re uh, reconstructed images, you are able to see if the valve is coifting well, whether there is stenosis or regurgitation. Another congenital example is unicuspid aortic valve. Um, and here um, you don't see the normal recurs, but rather you see a keyhole uh, type of appearance. And then uh, you can see bicuspid aortic valve, which is, by the way, the most common congenital heart disease. Uh, so for every single coronary CT that we read, uh, we tell the fellows to make a double oblique short axis view of the valve at that level, so you don't miss the bicuspid aortic valve. Uh, so as I said, uh, you're looking to see how the leaflets are, how many leaflets are there, and then go from there. And then uh, please note that the, because the valves are moving, uh, you need more than one phase to reliably assess for that. Moving on to stenosis, aortic valve calcium score, we get fair amount of records for, uh, from our clinicians to assess what is the valve calcium score. Uh, and generally, uh, this is similar protocol to a coronary calcium score. You just, instead of segmenting the coronary artery, you segment the valve itself and provide a calcium score. Uh, 
similar to that, you can also assess for mitral uh, annular calcification. Uh, that uh, sometimes is the culprit for uh, patients uh, mitral valve stenosis. Uh, you can also have uh, a fusion of congenital abnormalities and stenosis. So here is an example of a unileaflet mitral valve uh, that only has the anterior leaflet. You don't see the posterior leaflet on this image. And then uh, for uh, hemodynamic assessment, uh, it is uh, really good uh, to do that with MRI, particularly if you want to know what is the peak velocity and what is the peak gradient. You can calculate the gradient by using the formula 4D squared. So I mentioned the aortic valve calcium score, the value there, uh, particularly for men is greater than 2000 and for women uh, it's greater than 1200 is considered uh, significant. Uh, you're looking for restricted opening. That's why you need those multi-phase images. Uh, and then as I mentioned, MR is really good uh, for flow control. With regards to um, regurgitant lesions, uh, I, uh, I I think uh, when we only look at the uh, SSFP or Cine images, uh, I don't generally quantitate the degree of regurgitation based on Cine images alone, uh, because you can uh, you can be terribly wrong in doing so. So unless you have a 2D or a 4D phase contrast. Uh, then you can comment on what is the degree of regurgitation. But just based on how it looks on the cine images, I typically tell, tell my fellows not to say mild, moderate, severe. I just say a jet of mitral regurgitation is seen as you can see on these images. Um, and then you can calculate how much is the forward flow and how much is the backward flow. And then calculate the, the, the regurgitant fraction. You can calculate the regurgitant volume. Um, please note that sometimes regurgitation is associated with prolapse, particularly in the mitral space. Uh, so um, please watch uh, for mitral valve prolapse when you have a case of mitral valve regurgitation. Infective endocarditis is one of my very favorite topics. So uh, infective endocarditis uh, is much more common in patients who have prosthetic valve uh, already in place. Uh, what we are looking for is obliteration of the clear fat at the level of the aortic root or the valve involved and uh, replacement of that uh, with uh, the aortic root abscess. So unlike the abscesses that you see in the abdomen uh, and pelvis, these abscesses will typically not have the very well-defined rim enhancement. They typically start off by just dirty looking fat with a lot of mass effect. So this patient actually presented with valence wave on ECG and had uh, severe narrowing of their left main coronary artery because there was a root abscess here. Uh, vegetation is something that is uh, very uh, easily detectable. Uh, a lot of papers in this space uh, say that uh, it's harder to see smaller vegetation, which is, which is true if you have a very old generation CT scanner. But now that everybody is getting these better scanners, it's much more easier to see these vegetations. Um, so, uh, please note that these patients are many times very, very sick. So, CT is the modality uh, and not MAR in this case particularly. Uh, TE is good, but again, it is invasive and can only sometimes look at the aortic root uh, and uh, has very limited field of view. So, I like to uh, use CT here. Occasionally, there are patients who have had infective endocarditis and then the question is, is it still active? In that situation, it's fine to do a PET scan uh, to see if there is an active ongoing inflammation or infection there. And uh, also, uh, always look for adjacent compression, uh, like in this case of uh, compression of the left main coronary artery. Uh, Pre-procedure planning, you're going to see a lot of talks about TAVR and TMVR and valve and valve and whatnot. Uh, so see, please note that our uh, agenda here is simple. We are trying to see what is the size that uh, is going to uh, be right for this particular patient. We're going to see if there is a possibility uh, to place a device either in the native valve or a valve in valve. Is there a space to land that device? So we, a landing zone assessment is really important. And you will hear talks in the subsequent sessions about how to uh, do those measurements and what to report in your reporting subsequent. With regards to TMVR, it is really important that, that because you are going to place a large device there, it's going to narrow. 
the left ventricular outflow tract uh, that you can see here on those images as I'm pointing with my mouse here. So you need to know how much narrowing there is. So every TMVR report that comes out from my department has a percentage narrowing uh, after simulating the valve. With regards to masses, it is important, as I mentioned before, uh, to acquire uh, non contrast I'm just going to pause this for a second. Uh, so this is the patient uh, who came to us with an outside diagnosis of uh, well-defined enhancing mass attached to the mitral annulus. Um, I looked at the CT and I said, where is the non-contrast? I need a non-contrast scan. So we brought the patient back and we got a non-contrast scan only. And on this non-contrast scan, we can see that this mass is heavily calcified. So this is a caseous uh, type of mitral annular calcification. Um, we also see a fair amount of papillary fibroblastomas. My pathologist typically likes to, when, when they get excised, not all of them get excised, by the way. If a papillary fibroblastoma is at least 10 millimeter uh, in size, and particularly if they are located on the left side, in the context of pre-existing stroke, then they come out. My pathologist usually just takes it and drops it in a petri dish and then all the, the projections come alive once they are dropped into the petri dish, as you can see here on this image. So examples of papillary fibroblastoma, caseous mat. Uh, and then thrombi uh, are exceedingly common. Please note that the most common cardiac mass is actually thrombus. Uh, so make sure that you have evaluated possibility of a thrombus, particularly if the patient's ventricles are not contracting because it activates the virtual stride. Uh, so uh, make sure you obtain uh, a one minute or a two minute delayed images to assess for um, thrombus. Uh, sometimes you can catch uh, situations like this. This is a patient who has carcinoid, uh, and then you can see multiple hepatic lesions and exclusively right-sided uh, lesions here in terms of uh, tricuspid regurgitation, pulmonic regurgitation, and uh, it is um, known that there are there are so many systemic conditions uh, that can range from connective tissue diseases to infiltrative diseases to neoplastic etiologies and uh, here history and prior imaging are the two most important things for you to pick up the abnormalities. I think I've showed most of the examples of valvular heart disease. I have one last case to show and um, I hope I hit the diagnosis here. No, I did not. Uh, so many times the diagnosis is beyond the valve. So you have to image larger z-axis coverage. So here is an example of a shown, shown complex where you can see parachute mitral valve uh, where, with, um, uh, with aortic, uh, subaortic stenosis. You can have subaortic membranes. You can have coarctation of the aorta. Uh, recently, um, we used to think that only four findings are associated with shown complex, but now our understanding has evolved. And we now include bicuspid valve, hypoplastic left ventricle, co triatum and small aortic arch uh, along with shown complex. So some take home points, uh, choose what is right for your patient. Uh, please conduct a risk versus benefit analysis uh, with regards to contrast administration. Ta tailor your protocol to answer a specific diagnostic question. Do not perform every single sequence on every single patient. Uh, and please be aware of uh, wide spectrum of valvular diseases that affect um, uh, including the systemic diseases that can sometimes involve now. Here are some references. I would like to thank my team at Mass General uh, for uh, helping me survive on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, with that, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sandeep. That was absolutely incredible. That was a very, very comprehensive overview. For those of you, for those of the birds that missed the worm, seriously, this was like, he's gone through the entire gamut, how to do, when to do, why to do interpret the work, so it really covered everything the conference was really talking about. Yeah, Rajesh, question.
levels uh, for that uh, for assessing the either a calcium scoring of the aortic valve or for the MRI to assess the severity? We do. Uh, we, we do get those results, particularly we start to see a lot of low flow, low gradient aortic yeah. stenosis patients and where they want to know if there is a lot of calcium there. Uh, and uh, another category where we see these referrals is when they have tried to do a TTE, but TTE was not diagnostic because they just couldn't see the valve. In that situation, uh, they just come to us on CT. Uh, but many times, uh, as you rightfully pointed out, you can very well evaluate uh, and the valve and the stenosis uh, if there is a good quality. Yeah, I think flow quantifications are becoming more and more important by MR. And the same thing is even for mitral, where you really don't know whether it's mild, moderate, severe, and given the kind of subjectivity there is with echo. So there's a lot of people who now want an objective number which is coming from the MR, and especially in all the, any kind of studies that are happening, they're all almost necessitating CT and MR. Yeah, sure, Tarun. No, thanks for the excellent introduction. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, uh, can I ask you, uh, and also comment about aortic stenosis in particular, that now we are doing a lot of CTs to us for TAVI, TAVR planning, and I think it's a good opportunity at the time to confirm the degree of aortic stenosis and using aortic valve calcium as well as aortic valve planimetry in the mid-systolic phase of cardiac cycle. In your experience, Sandeep, uh, what is the cut? Do, do you agree with the cutoff given by the guidelines of 2,000 and in, in men and 1,300 in women? Well, uh, I, that, that's the best we have right now is how I would say it. Okay. Uh, we do report aortic valve calcium mm -hmm. score, and I think the next talk uh, by my colleague Burek uh, is on uh, tower planning. So yeah. we'll hear about uh, tower planning in detail. Because in my own experience, actually, the cutoff value should be much higher. Much higher. Much yes. higher. I think it's better to say 3,000 for men and 2,000 for women in my own analysis from experience of patients undergoing TAVI CT. Uh, that, that's yeah. true. Uh, we have seen that. A lot of these patients have, like, their their aortic valve calcium scores are incredibly high, like 5,000, 6,000, and so uh, Many times uh, we get these reports from outside hospitals mm -hmm. that say aortic valve calcium score is 10,000. And they don't realize that they, they are calculating the asymptotic calcification or calcification of the sinuses of um, valves are along the entire outer curve. Which yeah. Sometimes even pick up the MAC. Right, exactly. <laughs> they, they even pick up the MAC sometimes. So, no, that's a different thing. Obviously, yeah. then you are going to falsely elevate your exactly. calcium score exactly. of the valve. Yeah. 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 But not only that, the thing with calcium score is that it's not only the volume, but also the density. So that's the big one, where the density of the aortic calcifications is so high that the calcium number looks huge, even if uh, you know the volume may not be so much. So I think it's, it's the method that calcium scoring was used for something and is now being trying to extrapolate it to another thing. Great. So with that, thank you, Sandeep. Thank you for a great talk. And we'll go on to our next speaker.